Welcome. This is Mark Steiner on The Mark Steiner Show at The Real News Network. Senator Ben Cardin has been the U.S. Senator for a number of terms. He started his political career when he was 24 years old in the Maryland House of Delegates. He's running for re-election. One of his opponents is Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning, then Bradley Manning, was imprisoned for releasing over three quarters of a million documents about the Afghan and Iraq wars and exposed many lies and untruths that were told by this government. She is now, as resident of the state of Maryland, running against Ben Cardin and others in the U.S. Democratic primary for Senate here in the state of Maryland. Uh, and Chelsea, welcome. Good to have you with us it's here. It's great to be here. Listen to your show for many years. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, but let's just start with the why that everybody asks the question. Why run for, this, for the U.S. Senate from the state of Maryland? We know you moved to Maryland when you got out of prison. Yeah, well, I, I lived there before as well. You lived here when you were homeless in Chicago and then fled Chicago to, to Maryland? What was that story? Let's go back there. Yeah, so uh, 2006, I, you know, after being homeless for about six or eight months. And why uh, were you homeless? Uh, I got kicked out of my house. Okay, which happens <laughs> to a lot of teenagers. Yeah, but, you know, uh, right. I was a little too... Um, effeminate for, uh, for the it household. fit into their mold of who exactly. you're supposed to be. Exactly. Uh, uh, so uh, it didn't work out um, living with my father uh, in Oklahoma. So I, uh, I did what most, you know, queer and trans kids do and go to the biggest city that you can find. And, uh, and I uh, stayed there for about eight months. And, uh, and my aunt came and tracked me down. She lived on the East Coast. Uh, and she said, come stay with me, come live with me. And I've lived in Maryland ever since. So then you joined the Army. I did. And what drove you to join the Army? Um, well, I mean, I was, I, I was working two jobs at the time. Uh, I was dealing with being trans, and I was also in school. Uh, and trying to balance all of these different things uh, and not really knowing who I am or what I'm doing. Uh, and also, like, the sense of, like, insecurity and instability that I still had from, you know, my, my, my time mm -hmm. being homeless. I decided... Uh, I decided to, to consider other life options. And my father, who I was still in communication with, even though he kicked me out, I was still talking to him, and he encouraged me to... To join. Know, yeah, he, he encouraged me to listen. So, when you just what you said a moment ago, just, you were dealing with what, that you were trans. So yeah. You, so, you were clear about that even before you went into the Army? Uh, well, no, I wasn't clear about it. Okay. That was the thing, right. was I was right. like, you know, you know something is different it's about different, you, uh -huh. but... Uh, you know, like I was, I, I was dealing with that, but I was actually, you know, I was, see, I was seeing a therapist and I was ready, to, I was like almost ready to talk about it, but uh, I didn't, you know, uh, I, I, I ended up going down the direction of repressing it, of, you know, um, and I, you know, the military is like a hyper masculine environment. So yes, you, it is. It's, a, you, it's an environment. For, for men or women. Exactly. So, you <laughs> right. know, it was like an environment right. where it right. wasn't possible. And so it was like, oh, like this is a way of, you know, manning up. But it was also the, the environment of the time, you know, you had the, the, the Iraq war was in, you know, uh, turmoil. You had uh, uh, the biggest debate on television all, 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 like, every single night I saw on TV the same news story, which was the surge in Iraq and the debate over that. And uh, I felt like, because my dad was trying to encourage me to enlist in the Navy or the Air Force, and I was like, well, the, the Army is where things are happening. And so I enlisted in the Army uh, as an analyst. While you're in prison, to fight for your rights as a trans person. Yeah. I mean, that took a lot of heart. What else can you do but fight in, in a situation where you have, you're cornered against a wall and your entire existence is threatened and, oh, by the way, you're, you know, you, the, 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 the entire, you know, you're just surrounded by the violence of the state every day. So, of course I was going to fight, and of course I was going to make a stand. And, um, and I don't think, I, didn't, I don't think I realized how committed I was to, 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 have, to, to doing it until uh, I, I actually got into a hunger strike in 2016. I remember and, that, uh, yeah. That was really hard and really intense. Um, uh, but I knew like, after, by, by about you know, day four or day five, I was like, oh wow, I'm really doing this, so. And you really did it. Yeah, I really did. Um, <laughs> So, so coming to where we are now, because part of what we're talking about today, obviously, is your run for the United States Senate here in the state of Maryland yep. with, a, with a sitting U.S. Senator, Ben Cardin, who's been in for a long time, and is uh, a huge political figure in yeah. the state, right? Yeah, he's, he's been in Maryland politics for 40 years. He's been in, this is, this, he's two-term senator. Right. So. 
So uh, first elected in his 20s, the House of Delegates. So he's yep. been, in, been in politics for a long time. So what made you Too much time, I would say. Ah. <laughs> you wouldn't want to stay in 40 years? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so talk a bit about why, why it is you decided to run. I mean, what is it, that, because for two reasons. A, it's always difficult to take on an incumbent, even if you have a ton of money in this Democratic Party process and can push a candidate. Yeah. Um, and you always can be seen as the, the candidate on the side who's running against a Leviathan that cannot be beaten. Yeah. Right? So why are you running? So why am I running? Why, why, you, why, why wouldn't you I be running? Run? Why wouldn't I be running? Is the question. Uh, and you've got this, you've got the the establishment, which has been, you know, like Ben Cardin's been a perfect example of the Democratic establishment in particular. You know, he's a candidate who has, you know, one of the most remarkable things about Ben Cardin's career is how unremarkable his career has been. You know, in 40 years, he really doesn't have a whole lot of actual accomplishments. Uh, but do you act? But, but you know, like the more recently, he's had some really draconian policies that he's like supported as so, in what well like the anti bds uh bill that he's pushed multiple times in in the senate now uh which would criminalize it would actually make it a felony offense to uh to be a part of the anti boy you know the the anti israel boycotts and uh and you know the actions against israel um you know uh in in the, their dispute you know with uh palestine so, and, you know, and, and that's really having domestic, you know, like using a, a domestic policy to engage in foreign policy, which is, you know, and, 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 and against, you know, people that, you know, it's a, it's a free speech matter. It's, you know, there's so many different layers to this. And this is one of the bills that he's been trying to really push hard. Mm -hmm. The broader picture of things is, we, you know, both sides of the aisle always want more for this you know, vast, you know, whirling death machine, I like to call it, uh, which is the, you know, it's the surveillance state, it's the military, uh, ICE, um, the, you know, uh, the intelligence agencies, you know, like you've got this vast apparatus of, you know, of, of intersecting institutions like the Department of Defense, like the Department of State, like the Central Intelligence Agency, like uh, Home Department of Homeland Security and its subordinate agencies. And you've got this gigantic apparatus and it's always getting bigger. It's constantly getting bigger. We have a prison, we have the largest prison system in the world. We have the largest military and largest and most expensive military in the world. Uh, we incarcerate more people than any, any other country that I'm aware of. And we have the largest and most expensive intelligence, you know, apparatus in the world. I mean, and you, yet constantly we're hearing we want more. We, we, we're always needing more and more and more. Whenever actually we, you know, my position is we actually need less. We need a lot less. And we need to roll back and start dismantling many of these institutions to the point where we can say, you know what, we don't need prisons anymore. We can close, prison, we can close prisons. We can let prisoners go. We can uh, have less, less militarized paramilitary police on the streets. We can... You know, and, and and just looking in Baltimore, you know, the Baltimore Police Department obviously is an That's institution that probably mm -hmm. needs to be, you know, it, um, uh, like let's just get rid of the Baltimore Police Department. I mean, why do we have the Baltimore Police Department? You think we need we don't think we need a police department at all? Well, at this, you know, this this particular police department, I think, needs to be disbanded. You know, it's it, uh, and the Department of Justice report from the last two years, I think, shows that it's just. You know, and, and this is a this is among many other police agencies all across the country. You know, it's just system, these systemic problems have reached a point where you can't fix them. They're inherent to the system. You can't you can't fix it. So, so let's explain some of this a bit more. So, I mean, you you, you spent your time in the U.S. Army in, in the as an intelligence analyst. I did. Right. Yes. So this is one of your issues. Yes. The intelligence security network. So, what would you say your core issues here are? This clearly being one, what are the others? I would say that more immediately, we need to be dismantling a lot of these domestic policies that are, are foreign. They're basically based off of our foreign interventions. So I saw what was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. You and, served in Iraq. Right, I served in Iraq. And I, I've come, you know, I've, I've, I've gone full, it's gone full circle for me because that was one of the things that what we were doing there and the, the, the vast power that we had over hundreds of thousands of people at being an occupying force, you know, was one of the things that drove me into to, to actually doing a, a political thing in the first place. 
and now I'm out and I see that what we've done is we've moved it home. So now we're living in this militarized domestic occupation uh, where the government is, are, is, is essentially a military occupying power in many neighborhoods, especially the most vulnerable neighborhoods and uh, communities, you know, people of color, you know, immigrants, uh, you know, and this, this is happening here in Maryland. It's, and it's happening all across the country. And, you know, institutions like ICE and institutions like, um, like our prison system and uh, the, 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 the vast, you know, fe you know, the Federal Bureau of Prisons and, you know, the, the network of state, you know, of state prisons that have federal contracts. Um, you know, it's, it's just this entire, it's, it's trying to push back against this entire framework. So there are a lot of people in the state of Maryland who say, who would say, Chelsea Manning divulged state secrets. Chelsea Manning put the United States at risk. Or some people even on the liberal progressive end might say, uh, Chelsea Manning worked with Assange, who's clearly working with the, some people would argue is working with the Russians, um, and to defeat the Democrats and work in helping Trump win. So the, the, those, those are things that clearly, that are in many people's minds, all right? So, I mean, how do you respond to those things? I mean, I did, I did this thing in 2010, first off. Uh, and the government had a gigantic court case, you know, this massive court case. It took them three and a half years to put together. And they never did it. They never said I did anything except for potentially cause damage. You know, that was that, what their entire case was based off of. So there's no, there's no basis for many of these uh, of these statements, and that was one of the reasons, that was one of the drivers to, for the release campaign and for me to, to, to be out here again, was the fact that, you know, they just never, there was no dice. Um, I mean, these are, this is the language of power, you know. People in power have a tendency of having names and labels for people that they don't like, people that, that are opposed to them, you know. Uh, dissidents, uh, criminals, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, undocumented people, they, they're illegals, they're, um, they're criminals, they're traitors, you know, like these, th this is just a, a language of power and it's, a, it's an argument by authority. Many of these arguments are simply argument by authority, where I'm an authority figure and it's true because I said so. And there's no disputing that because of the position that I'm in. So the the other thing clearly has been thrown your way is this rally party you attended for with the people who helped helped elect Donald Trump, with some pretty, for want of a better term, kind of vicious, uh, underhanded right wing folks. Mike Cernovich, Dax right. Sobiec, right, uh, et cetera. Right. Yes. I watched the Twitter feed, and I read that, again, the Twitter feed going back and forth. A lot of people who were Democrats were saying, uh, who would be in the primary you're in, who would be voting, saying that uh, what bad judgment this was. Why would she do that? And how could she sit with these people and then dismiss it as just trying to get information and find out what, they, what, what trying to do undercover work? So, so what, what, what exactly motivated that, and what do you have to say about that now? I saw what happened in Charlottesville, and it drove me into you know, doing activism again. I went to a Milo Yiannopoulos uh, protest. Uh, against him. Right, <laughs> against, against him against him and right. Mike, Mike Cernovich uh -huh. and, uh, and, and a number of other people, uh, Lucian Wintrich. Uh, um, and I, so, I so I attended a protest again, against them uh, in September and uh, working with a number of other activists, I, we identified sort of a person that I had a tie or connection and some way in which we could potentially maybe gain information uh, through, a, through this person or, or develop a relationship through this person. And so we developed this, you know, project over several months and uh, uh, led to a, a meet, you know, led to one or two meetings. Uh, and I just, it, it became this self-perpetuating sort of project where we're learning a lot, an enormous amount of information about not just the alt, the alt light as it's called, the Cernovich camp, but also the alt right, you know, the, the, the more Richard Spencer's, uh, more, more outwardly uh, racist camp. And, and then the, the connections to the administration as well, you know, the, um, but what happened was in January, there was sort of a, a, a crossroads, if you will, where the, uh, the book Fire and Fury had come out, and a lot of the information that we had learned, you know, was, was already was in the book, so it kind of lost its value. Um, and so, and and we were kind of reaching an, uh, an end point to the, the, the this project, and 
Uh, and so then this party came up and I was uh, intending on crashing it. We, we went and we, we crashed it. We, we worked, you know, through Cassandra Fairbanks was uh, the person that we worked through. And we Who's the woman who worked for Bernie Sanders then went to work for Trump? Right. And she also worked um, in the campaign to have me released previously. Right. Um, and she has been a supporter for many years. I, and I bear a lot of responsibility in this. I screwed this up because I wasn't considering the, opt the optics of this. You know, we had the intent of doing, of, of, un of working at any, by any means necessary to undermine the alt-right because they're a threat to millions of people. I mean, the, you know, and even the alt-light, you know, they're a lot less you know, they're, they're a little bit more slick and, you know, they wear suits and they, they say they're not racist, but, you know, they, they, they have really bad intent and they're disgusting people. But, you know, as much as we can protest against them, you know, having hundreds, of, having hundreds, if not a thousand people protest against them is not going to bring them, is not going to be the only thing that brings them down. But I screwed up. And I had the best intent, but I, I, I screwed this up and I hurt a lot of people uh, because of the way it got spun. And we also lost a sort of our sense of what we were doing. So I mean, and I did. I, I lost a sense of what I was doing. At that moment. Yeah, and I, and, and I, I regret it. So, so the other thing is that when you, when you take that, when you look at the state of Maryland, and the state of Maryland is a state that's increasingly... Um, multiracial in ways it was never in the past in terms of black votes and Latino voters and other voters in the state of Maryland um, and also a lot of Jewish voters in the state of Maryland a lot both Montgomery County and in around Baltimore City in the, in the suburbs of Baltimore what do you have to say to men and women in the black community who are dealing either with the kind of overt racism that people deal with in the state of Maryland whether they're middle class or poor people and what you have to say with working class people who are losing work in the city of Baltimore and all around the state, I mean, what 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 do you what what do you say to them about what you want to fight for in the U.S. Senate that is directly in in, the, in in people's interests in the state? It's not just about ending mass incarceration; it's about ending incarceration. It's not just about uh, you know making ICE more friendly; it's about getting rid of it. It's not just about ensuring that people have uh, access to jobs or access to income or access to health care. People need free single-payer health care. They, uh, they need a living wage, or, or I, I w I've even called for universal basic income, where you just get an income, with all of the benefits that come from you know, having uh, a, uh, the, the ability to you know, housing, stable life. We need these things, and we need. We can't wait for these things. We can't keep, you know, the rhetoric of the of the establishment is that whenever they're in power, you know, whenever the Democratic establishment is in power, just wait, and we'll we'll get to it. And they never do. And we can't wait anymore. We have to implement vast changes in policy. We have to start dismantling the prison system. We have to start addressing, you know, ICE. We 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 can't keep waiting and waiting and when not doing anything. You know, what you just described here, I think is really important to kind of explore. I was thinking about this in terms of uh, 1968 and the Poor People's Campaign. I guess I'm obsessed about that lady because I've been working in that and teaching it. Yeah. And, and the demands that were made in 1968 in the Poor People's Campaign, a multiracial army of the poor ascending on Washington, D.C., and I was in the middle of that, um, were things like either full employment or guaranteed income, investing $35 million into ending poverty in America every year, which is a lot more, now would be in these, it would be 235 some billion dollars we're talking about a year. So I mean, what do you bring to the table that people really, in those kind of things the way you're describing, that, that kind of grab a hold of what people are fearful of, what they, the changes they want to see uh, in the state of Maryland, they might not think that Ben Cardin and others are delivering. I've been homeless, I've been to war, I've been to prison. I'm not doing politics because I want to do a career for 40 years. I'm doing this because I believe in these pol th that these policies need to be changed. I also don't believe that any of these people are going to address it. 
Jesse Manning, it's been a pleasure to finally meet you and face to face and have you here. Uh, Thank you. After talking about for you about you, talking about you for years on the radio, it's good to finally meet yeah, you. Yeah, and I was a listener. <laughs> Thank you very much. That means a great deal to have you listening to us. It's a little mad out, but so uh, we'll see you down the campaign trail. All right. And I'm Mark Steiner here for the Mark Steiner Show on the Real News Network. Stay tuned next week. We'll have a whole lot more.